covered, uh, so I, I won't go into it. But the, there was three takeaways that were kind of popular ideas from the, all the group that I, the, the group feedback I received. So I'm going to run through those, and each of them have to be kind of dealt with in different ways. Uh, so the, the first thing is I'd thrown out the idea of using a subcommittee approach because it seemed like a couple of meetings ago that we were struggling with how, you know, how we, how we approach each chapter one at a time, but it's just out of necessity from time constraints, it's kind of a surface level approach a lot of the time. So I was thinking like, how do we, not bog down the entire planning commission and meet like every week or something like that. But how do we, how do we use, you know, re time resources and the staff resources we have, but do more. And so the idea was to have like a subcommittee type um, approach that's used often, you know, commissions like this. Uh, and so I threw that out there and, and people gave a lot of feedback about that and everyone's seemed to be in favor of it. Uh, so uh, I think we're going to do that. Uh, and we're going to have to develop it out and flush it out exactly how we go about taking the subcommittee approach going forward. But I'll share with you some of my thoughts about it. Um, and then, but then I'm going to keep going, uh, with the other, with the other takeaways, the other big takeaways. So the big picture thing with the subcommittees is that the idea would be, you know, two or three people meet, take a deep, deeper dive on a chapter, uh, topic outside of our regular meetings and then come back <clears throat> to the meetings with a deeper dive and deeper understanding of, of the area. And it would be a way for us to put more of our, you know, fingerprints on what's going on and take deeper dives without, you know, using everyone's time. Well, what, we're, what we'd have to do is we're going to have to figure out, you know, what chapters are a priority because not every chapter would this be appropriate for. We'll have to kind of flesh out, you know, what the expectations are for the subcommittee review. Um, I, I'm not picturing that this is going to be something that takes up staff, and I think it's going to be important that we don't do something that takes up a bunch of staff, especially considering the furloughs and what Mike's office is going through right now. Um, so, you know, this is but this this is going to require more work from you know the planning commission. Um, so that's the general kind of things to think about for us and and for us to flesh out going forward. And uh, when I'm done talking here, I'd like to hear what your guys' thoughts are about that. Uh, one part of this, one open question about the subcommittees is going to be how we incorporate that with whether the subcommittees are going to do any outreach themselves, or are we gonna tackle like any kind of public outreach separately from that? And so that kind of segues me into the second thing. And that was the big takeaway, or the second big takeaway from the feedback I received was that a lot of people are interested in doing public, getting information from the public, getting, uh, doing outreach, however you want to put it, getting feedback from the public though, in the short term, uh, and not wait. Uh, there seem to be a lot of people interested in it, And I think that that's, um, a good instinct too, is that let's go ahead at this stage and get more public involvement. Now, Another thing I'd like to hear from everyone else is how exactly how exactly you'd like to go about that. Would we like the subcommittees to go and do some outreach? If they do, it's probably going to be outreach to the the kind of vested characters within the city as it is. I mean, it's not going to probably be a widespread, broad outreach if the subcommittees are doing it. Or do we want to do as a planning commission figure out a way to do some broad citywide outreach? Uh, one idea could be like a survey with both open-ended questions and closed questions to sort of get, you know, to have some closed questions about, you know, where we are and what we think and to try to get feedback about that then having open-ended questions where people can just tell us anything related to city planning that's of concern. If, you know, if we do the survey, um, the, again, we'd have to be conscientious of staff time and we probably would have to have that be like a, a planning commission document and not not ask Mike to do that I think um, so that's that's one thing that's one approach we could take I like that because it gets feedback from people who just are not people whose part of their lifestyle is to come into events or hearings it's makes it easy on them and and I and I, I think that's the easiest way and, and I'm thinking paper too or we can do a combo of paper and digital 
um, and have the same survey both ways. But I do think for some people, I mean, paper is the only way we're going to hear from them. Another, another thing that we could do with outreach possibly is have an event. And I know that there's been events in Montpelier in the past. I haven't been part of an event that's just about public outreach, I don't think. Um, but I've heard that we've had them before and other cities have them. We could have an event. Uh, there could be a lot of good things about an event. My concern, going back to what I was talking about the survey, would be, are you going to get the same, the, the, vest, the kind of vested people who tend to show up at these things uh, or not? Because I think when it comes to outreach right now, there's, I, there's different ways of looking at it. There's the ways of looking at it like, is, is the planning commission like, you know, I, I don't know how to put this, but like, I think it is, there's like a political version where, oh, well, we asked everyone if they had input. And then there's the version where, no, I mean, we really want to know so that we are making informed decisions. I mean, and, and I'm not trying to make the first one sound cynical or anything, but I think that from the, from the feedback that people want to really know like what our community is thinking. And we, so anyways, so that's, so that's something to think about the approaches. The third thing I'll touch on real quick is there were a few people who wanted us to kind of sketch out a long-term plan for this. Uh, and so once we've made some decisions about outreach and made some decisions about the subcommittees and once, and um, I can get in touch with Mike about what's coming down and then I'll, I'll put together like an outline like that's long-term. So that's something that I can do myself. Um, so with that, those are the three big items uh the subcommittees and the outreach stuff what do you guys think i open the floor to anybody Kirby. yeah um yeah i think the idea of the subcommittees is is a good one and i think that'll add a lot more depth um i'm am interested to know what the timing would be like for the subcommittees with how much time they might have between getting the document from from Mike before we review it as a as a planning commission. Um, and also would this be a volunteer volunteer kind of thing or are you going to want to assign us or you know how would that work? Yeah, I, I, my thoughts right now are people would volunteer. And um, if we did two or three people per topic, depending on what topics we choose, it may be we could get away with mo at least most people only having to do one, you know, uh, and the one that they think is important. But it, that depends on as a group what we what we're choosing to prioritize, what we think is like subcommittee worthy. And then to go back to the first, what was the first part of your question? Oh, about the timing of it. Um, yeah, this would. I mean, we've already we've already gone over some of these chapters. Like we've already gone over housing, but I think housing is one that we should have a subcommittee on. Um, so in that case, we've already we've already done it, and so maybe one maybe we could do this for the chapters that the planning commission's already done a one over on. I don't know. Well, we, yeah, I mean, we could do both. We could have uh, an introduction for chapters we haven't looked at yet, which I think would be helpful for the whole planning commission to look at. But some chapters, like housing, have, have been affected by COVID, so it makes sense to go over that one again. Yeah. I also think that the document that Mike sent out this past week um, from the, uh, the, the Congress of yeah, I forgot that. has some really great practical solutions for housing. Um, and, I, and I know that our housing chapter probably already has a lot of that in there, but I'd like to, I'd like to compare the two documents. Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to do housing if we're volunteering. Yeah, I would too. And and there's, and there's economic development, I think, is one um, that comes to mind as, as subcommittee worthy. I don't know what else. I actually haven't reviewed the list of what chapters. How many chapters have we done already, Mike? Um, we did housing. Housing, historic preservation. Economic development. Well, that one's not done, right? Well, I mean, we've 
We've got the version that we're working on to make comments on. Uh, historic housing implementation, economic development, and energy are the ones that you have. The ones that are that were almost ready before COVID hit were natural resources, transportation, and utilities and facilities. I have drafts for that aren't complete. So those would be the next ones you'd be getting. And community services, I started, which really wraps up almost all of the required chapters. <laughs> then we have optional ones that we've talked about adding in on arts and culture, governance and public safety are ones that are not required under statute, but we had planned on doing chapters for. So if we continue so, on that path, we've got three that would still have to get started. So I think, I mean, for, a for you know, time management purposes, um, I wasn't thinking we were gonna get this hammered out tonight. I just wanted to put it on people's minds to think about the subcommittees and what we could do with that. I mean, we, I, I think, you know, I've gotten enough feedback at this point where I think people want to do it. So we're going to plan to do this. We're going to do this. Uh, I think we're and one of, you know, there's a few things we got to work out. Um, so possibly we'll put it on the agenda for next time to hammer out some things. Maybe I'll pitch a version of this and then we can modify it as the group sees fit. Um, one thing about timing, Barb touched on a second ago about like, like the timing of how things will work out. I think we'll want to figure out what we want to do with outreach before we decide to pursue the subcommittee thing anyway. Um, so maybe we can segue into, into talking about that for a minute. Um, everybody, uh, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll start with this survey. Who likes the idea of a survey? Can you, can I see a hands if you think that that's could be worthwhile? Yeah. Okay. I think it's, it's done well. Not like a survey for the sake of a survey. But. Yeah, I think, John, you hit the nail on the head of my concern, which is I'm, I'm wary of a survey approach only because crafting a survey for it to be effective is really difficult to do. It's, it's, it's really, you got to be really careful about it. And I worry about not doing a good enough survey to get the kind of information that we really want. So, would you see this survey going out by chapter or for the entire document? Um, I mean, at this early stage, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, for some closed ended questions, we would recognize, you know, what were the what we want feedback the most on and ask about those. And this would be across all the chapters we have so far. And then the open-ended stuff, I really mean to leave it open-ended to let people tell us what's on their minds so that we're not directing them. And maybe, you know, I'm trying to think about, yeah, qualitative data and how to do it well. Maybe you put the open-ended up front so that you're not, you know, guiding people's thinking at first. Um, yeah, I just think people care about documents or chapters. I think we have to ask them, you know, what do they like about it? Our community and, and if they could change some things what would that be well yeah i, I just suspect that they're gonna their thinking would be directed by various topics whether it be energy or transportation or any of those particular things but it certainly makes more sense to do it as a single um outreach i think we're going to have to be careful too if we're going to be basically doing staffing this and uh because there's no capacity in mike's office so how are we going to distribute it because as you kirby you and john both know you know, there's there's all, there are always the people who say that they didn't they weren't asked they didn't get the information so we have to just be really broad based in how we distribute it well one, one concern i had about the survey was the this distribution like i was saying before i mean trying to think it through I mean, we could do something like Front Porch Forum, which would be free and have links and, and do some free things. But I think a, having a paper version is a way to reach a certain audience, which is going to have costs. And I wanted to ask Mike if he was, what his thoughts were about the associated costs with sending out a paper survey. 
we're not going to have a lot of resources. We've cut most of our budget down on things. So, um, like our advertising budget and our um, mailing budget, both are pretty trimmed down quite a bit. So I don't know if we'll have that. Um, if you know, one option which we could talk about maybe if we want to after we have the hearing, we can kind of jump back into it if we've got a little bit more time. Is the municipal planning grant is coming out, so we can kind of look at also look at this in two two windows. One is what do we want to do in the window from now to December with us and look at a separate window, which is, you know, we can have a consultant on board for January for 2021. And that can provide us a different set of skills and a different, you know, window of, of opportunities to go through and say, you know, we're going to do X amount of work now. And then, and then we can do surveys, you know, cause we can build that into that person's work. You know, what are we doing with that person's work? Um, you know, do we want to have that person focus on um, handling the outreach for us and handling the surveys and handling all those pieces? Um, because we're going to probably need, COVID's still going to be going on. We're probably going to need somebody with skills I don't have, which is the public outreach skills. How are we going to reach out to the public when the public can't come to a public meeting? And how do we reach out to the public when the public is meeting virtually? Um, you know, these are going to be going to probably take some skills from people who are doing things different. Um, you know, and again, as I said, we can talk a little bit more about what we want a consultant to do for us um, because we also have some needs if we're going to build this online um, and if we're going to build this um, in, in the ARC GIS system for the, uh, for the hub, we're going to need somebody who's, who's really kind of got some skills doing that. Um, and do we want to have somebody, a contract that does that? So I think, I, and I think that's not necessarily two separate things because a lot of online outreach can be done through the hub. And I think we just have to have somebody who comes in who kind of understands all the pieces and parts that can really weave that into a online presence and, you know, a not online presence so we can get, get both, both sets. But I think we could talk more about what we can do kind of short term and long term. Um, I don't know if we want to kind of get the some of the pieces done on the on the hearing and kind of get that behind us and see what time we have left to kind of talk a little bit more. Um, okay. Um, yeah, th yeah, that's fine. I mean, we can move on. Um, I mean, we can come back to this this topic a little bit more. Um, I, I, I mean, one, one thing I want to want to learn for everybody right now, if I can, is just, I mean, there was a sense of wanting to do some outreach now. Mike was just mentioning some options with the grant later, which we could do both, of course, and, and we probably will. Um, but if we're going to do something now, and because people are, you know, uncomfortable in, re, in working on the city plan because they feel like we're not getting sufficient feedback now, how would you, what are your opinions on how that should look like in the short term? Kirby, can I ask you a question? When you say that there are members that are concerned that we're not getting sufficient feedback now, like feedback in terms of what? Like just what, what are we missing? Like feedback on sort of the nuts and bolts priorities that we've been reviewing in the various chapter mm -hmm. outlines or just sort of like thematic goals you know for the planets in generally um people people vocalize in different ways or or, or described in different ways i mean um it's a general disconnect with what you know where where the community is and where where we are and they want to just want to touch base to make sure that we're kind of in step with the general community does that answer your question? I think so. I mean, yeah. just the general feeling, you know. Um, and yeah, and we we are going to have to narrow it down. If we like, if we did a survey, we'd have to choose what the questions are going to be, and like, where I mean, we'd have to specifically figure out like where we're uncomfortable 
and what we want to know about. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking, I mean, I, I think we can revisit this later on in the meeting. I'm, I'm just trying to chew it on this a little bit. I, it just seems to me that we've got a bunch of outlines for chapters sort of fleshed out right now. We're going to have another couple of chapters. We're going to get done fairly soon. We should have most of those in place before we really drill down, put pen to paper, and start drafting things in these subcommittees. It seems like that might be the once we get all those done, that seems like a logical point to sort of put those outlines out there as sort of a framework for people to look at and provide feedback on whatever they want, really. And I don't even think we would necessarily need uh, a survey to go along with it because there would be sort of guideposts in those outlines that we would put out there, um, you know, and we can, and the subcommittees can take those comments into consideration if they affect, you know, the certain chapters that each subcommittee is dealing with. But I feel like you want to give the public some structure around which to provide comments. And I think throwing out those uh, sort of chapter outlines is a good way to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I heard both points of view, you know, through the comments, there was a point of view that you just that you just were, were talking about. And then the, the flip side of that is wanting to get some general feedback from people where uh, it's not based on what, you know, the way that we put it in front of them to get more, you know, abstract, I guess you could say. But uh, anyways, yeah, there's, there's no, there's no reason to like debate that or anything though. Um, okay. Uh, does anybody else have anything? Do, Marcella, did you have anything to say about that before we, before we move on for now? No, uh, I'm, I think it's, a, if we're going to circle back, I might have more, but I think it's fine right now. Okay. Okay. So yeah, everybody think about, everyone think about that. Uh, and we'll, we'll put it on the agenda for later to hammer out some of these um, concepts. Um, okay. Well, with that, we can move on on the agenda and we move to our general business uh, where uh, if there's any comments from the public about something not on the agenda, um, now would be the time. I'm not seeing that there's anyone here from the public that, who's not on the agenda. So if there are no, if there are no, if there's no general business comments, we can move on to the uh, minutes. So if everyone could take a look at the minutes that were sent around from July 13. I have a question about the first paragraph after public hearing on zoning changes. First sentence, design review district boundary changes and changes to design review rules, Mike reviewed map regarding changes to the zoning boundaries as previously discussed. So that, did that happen? Did we talk about zoning or did we talk about the design review? It's design review boundaries, what that should say, yeah. Okay. I thought the zoning was later. So change zoning to design review? Yeah. Thanks. Everyone okay with that change? Yep. Mike has it. Good. Um, I have a couple of things under in the last paragraph on the first page. Um, it talks about Brooke, um, who I assume, um, I assume was Brooke Dingledine. Um, could we identify her as the attorney for Jim Barrett? Because nowhere in here have we you know, designated who she is. can do that. And then the second thing I had was on the boat. Um, the straw vote. Um, I know that must have been really confusing on the recording in terms of what we actually voted on. But my impression on what we voted on was that we voted between splitting the property and or changing changing river um, the river um, district to to use a condition to have a conditional use for the storage units. Is that correct? 
That is what we voted on, wasn't it? Yeah, there was two competing visions. One was conditional use, the other one was splitting the parcel. Right. That's not what it says in our in our minutes. Doesn't so it say that in the in the paragraph above the actual vote? Right. So if then the next paragraph said that the straw vote was add conditional use to the riverfront or split the property was what we ended up voting on. No, I think it was. Oh, I see that. I see that. Okay. So in the next paragraph, it say, could say the uh, conditional use or splitting the property came for, up for a straw vote. Well, I think we had agreed on splitting the property. And the question was no, we, whether we expand Eastern Gateway or not. No, the, no. what we agreed on was either was the two proposals that were up for consideration were provide conditional use for uh, storage units on the parcel uh, or in the in the zoning district or um, split the parcel and have one side be Eastern Gateway. The other one is the riverfront or the, the river side of the tracks is riverfront. Right. Yeah, so the paragraph above is correct. The choice discussed in that paragraph is correct. Right, but the second paragraph mischaracterizes Barb's proposal. It says an expansion of Eastern Gateway, which should be uh, splitting the parcel as opposed to expansive Eastern Gateway. Yeah, it's both split and expand in the same time. Right, you could say split and expand. So I'll put I'll be, I'll do that if you guys are okay I can use quotations put conditional use in quotes and then put split and expand of Eastern Gateway in quotes. Yeah the 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 first paragraph there I mean yeah as long as you make it clear that because saying conditional use to the riverfront isn't quite accurate because we were talking about changing just that neighborhood not not the entire riverfront. Oh, that's true. No, no, we we did we did the proposal was to extend conditional use to the entire riverfront because the thought was. was I thought it was just the route two. It was route two uh, neighborhood, right. wasn't it? That was my, that was my understanding. Oh, the, it, the, yeah, the route two neighborhood is part of the riverfront district, but it's not the only neighborhood. And, oh, sorry. How far does riverfront go? Aaron, it's a big part. The route two is a big part of Riverfront. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. My apologies. You know, one thing that would make that second paragraph easier would be if it was if there was a colon after um, the choice is discussed, because there are a number of different choices, and they tend to sort of run it together. I mean, I actually think they're one, two, three. Four. There are four different choices discussed. You see what I mean, Mike? Oh, I, oh so you want to see, would rather see colons between all those. Leave it well, as it is, colon, change. Eastern Gateway. Or just a, at least a colon to identify that we have a list here. And that list has four different options. Yeah, four. But then the vote was actually just on two of those. Okay. All right. After, yeah, were, colon, to leave it as it is, change yeah. the lot to Eastern Gateway, add conditional use to the Route 2 neighborhood, or split the property by the railroad tracks into riverfront. Right. Do you want colons or semicolon? Maybe it's a semicolon. Well, it'd be the colon after were. Oh, all right. All right. I would probably add semicolons after each one of those. And I can do that. Just to just to make it clear that we were looking at a number of different choices. Yeah, and then two of them came up to vote. One was the conditional right. option. Right, two of them. And the split and expand Eastern Gateway 
option came up for straw votes and each one went to a 3-3 vote. So conditional use had a vote of three and then uh, split and expand had a vote of three? Yes. Okay, thanks. I had sent out a, uh, an email this week that, where I thought I gave a summary of that. Um, okay. Yeah, I think so. If that helps. Okay. Any more changes from minutes? We all set? Motion as amended. Okay. All in favor of uh, changing the Making sure the minute. Yeah. Did we get a motion in a second? No, I'm asking um, for a motion. Uh, on the amendments or on the entire um, minutes? Oh, oh. The minutes is amended. <laughs> I'll second. Okay. Oh, okay. So Aaron, Aaron uh, made a motion on the to approve the minutes as amended, and we have a second from Barb. Uh, those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, say aye. 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 Okay. All opposed. Okay. And it's approved as amended. Moving along. Okay, the public hearing on zoning changes. This is uh, related to the topics we were just discussing from uh, last week, where uh, we had a hearing last week uh, that involved the uh, changes to the design review district and the regulations. Uh, and that was uh, all that business was was finished during the hearing and, and we had a vote and we passed that on to the city council. Uh, but we had tabled this other issue that came up, which was completely different, um, which is related to zoning, you know, possible changes to the zoning around Pioneer Street. Um, the short version of the, uh, the background here is that uh, we have a property owner who would like to possibly build some um, storage unit facilities uh, on the uh, on the parcel there near, next to Pioneer Street, uh, this was a there's already some uh, units there, uh, but since the new zoning that took place uh, a couple years ago, um, that use is no longer allowed, and uh, so we were we've kind of been confronted with. Uh, you know, was this intentional to make this use that's already there something that's not allowed anymore? Um, what can we do to um, to uh, reconsider whether storage units are appropriate here, and 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 what kind of solution is the best fit? We talked about trying to do something that's kind of surgical, so that we're not opening up the door to all kinds of other uses at the same time. So we have two competing. Uh, proposal that, that we talked about last time and each of them had three votes out of four members we had four members present uh in voting and no, is that right no no we had we had five 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 so yeah yeah we had we had five members stephanie and john weren't there uh last week uh or last math last meeting rather uh and so the so the you know each each proposal had the support of three votes, so not a quorum, not or not a you know not a majority out of the seven uh, members. So uh, so that's where we were. Um, of course, those aren't our only two options. We could come up with something different tonight, or we could follow uh, what was discussed last time. And in a nutshell, just like we were talking about with the minutes, the two uh, proposals uh, are this. One of them is to possibly div uh, divide. Uh, the the uh, zoning district there, or the um, the two well, divide the two parcels there and and separate how they're zoned, having uh, and using the railroad track that's present through the two parcels um, as a dividing line, and have the side that's nearest to Route Two, nearest the road, uh, be Eastern Gateway, and then the other side of the tracks that's towards the river would would stay as it is. Is that accurate? Yes. So that's one idea. Um, 
And the second idea was to uh, keep things as they are, but include uh, a, a note in the zoning regulations that in this neighborhood only, uh, that storage units would be allowed uh, in the riverfront district, because that's the zoning district that the current zoning district that these parcels are in. Uh, the storage units would be allowed, but not in, not across the entire district, just in this one neighborhood. More, uh, more, more specifically, it would be allowed as a conditional use. That's right. That it would be allowed as a conditional use. Uh, what's up, Barb? I'm I'm looking back at the chart, and I realize I didn't have the use chart in front of me last time, and I'm still confused because warehouse or storage is currently conditional in Riverfront. Um, it's the mini warehouse that is not. Yeah. Why couldn't they argue that it was a storage building? It's a different use. I mean, defined, in the definitions. Defined um, in what way? What's the definition that excludes mini storage um, self storage units from being warehouse or storage. I think it's just in, it's a part of the definition in the definition section of the zoning, which I'd have to go and so pull back. It out. looks it would come under what am I looking for? Mini warehouse. I could jump in. I don't have the ordinance in front of me, but I recall that there's a specific definition for warehouse that says it does not include mini warehouses, and then there's a mini warehouse definition. I'm not finding a mini warehouse definition, but maybe it's under warehouses. Um, but it defines to. Uh, but that particular conditional use is where warehouse or storage. So why is this not a storage and not a mini warehouse? So the mini warehouse definition, mini warehouse means a site structure or part of a structure intended to provide individual storage spaces for lease to either commercial or wholesale customers for storage of business goods or to the general public for storage of households goods, commonly called self storage facilities. And that's right. what a mini okay. warehouse is. But instead we're allowing unconditionally allowing site structure or part of a structure intended for storage and distribution uses. I guess I'm just wondering what revisiting the rationale behind that. Usually those larger warehousing is a generally a part of another use. So for example, there's warehousing that is a part of Caledonia Spirits. Within the Caledonia Spirits complex is a portion, is a use for warehousing. And they could that could be warehouse or storage considered. And it could be warehouse or storage, but it's generally for what's going on on site as opposed to being available for the public. I see. So I've got um, uh, some other, uh, another piece to add. I got an email from Dan Armstrong and Dan is the owner or one of the owners of the La Vermont Laser Wash. And so he wanted to say that as for my thoughts, I really like the idea of changing the zoning to allow for future expansion or changes of use to our building. We have been considering extending a portion of our building uh, a small amount to allow for better customer experience and for our customers um, are always asking for vacuums. So maybe someday it would be great to change the building to allow that or even to add some space for interior detailing. After COVID struck, we decided not to pursue those options while we all just try to stay in business through these crazy times. It would certainly be a bummer not to have the ability to make those changes. Um, so thanks for the information. He was going to try to make the meeting, um, but apparently he hasn't. 
So I guess the, the factor that that would factor in is that simply amending the warehouse would not, of course, there's the warehousing is only one nonconformity. Um, we'd also identified the fact that the car wash itself is a nonconformity. So fixing, um, fixing the use table for one wouldn't necessarily um, fix the car wash. I'll just put that out as information and, and he wanted to have his thoughts um, included here. Okay, that's good to know. Um, if we if we if we did the uh, if we if we did the split the parcel approach, would that would that affect uh, would, the, would the I guess my question is would the car wash fall into an entire zone or would that parcel be split? That would be entirely in the zone. It would it, it would it be entirely in Eastern Gateway? Yes. Okay. So so that everyone understands that. Uh, the, the split the parcel approach seems like it would make the car wash owner happy. Um, the other proposal that we've that, that we've considered uh, would either not uh, you know not address the issue that we just heard about, or we would need to alter it so that it would uh, so that it would address it. And and I don't know specifically what we'd exactly have to do. I, I don't know if it's as simple as also noting that car washes are allowed or we'd have to do something more than that. Defer to Mike on that, obviously. But something. Yeah, it would just be, it would be making two changes to the use table if you wanted to address both through the first option. Is, is that how you think we should do it, it, it through the use table and not just a note? Well, it would be a note in the use table. Okay. Go ahead, Barb. Thanks for doing um, Yeah, was there another issue too that if we um, if we made the mini warehouse um, conditional use um, in in its existing zone in the riverfront, um, that there would be other requirements that came into play for for Mr. Barrett. Yes, it would be more but challenging. This, it would I be more challenging for Mr. Barrett under riverfront because there's other requirements, dimensional requirements, such as the, the height requirement. There's a minimum height requirement in riverfront that does not exist in Eastern Gateway. So it's it would probably be preferential for them to be in the Eastern Gateway as opposed to the riverfront. And the Eastern Gateway would potentially take care of the car wash? And Eastern Gateway would take care of the car wash. Um, so, so about those height requirements, Mike, what's your opinion on, on the need for, for height requirements that are, that are that tall? So the, the, we did have conversations about that when we were developing the zoning and, uh, there were more minimum height requirements in other districts that were eventually removed but they, they remained in Riverfront. And a lot of it has to do with trying to build, um, it's, it's trying to build kind of the, the form. We don't have form-based codes, but it's really looking at the form of what's going on. We wanna build not just single story buildings. We don't want somebody to either take a vacant lot or to tear down a building and then replace it with a single story building. We wanna see multi-story, um, for a number of just um, density issues. You add more density, it adds more, I mean, if you get into the, the grand list um, and look at it from an economic standpoint, you just build a lot more value into structures when they're multi-story. Um, you're gonna generally see multi-use. You know, a lot of ours have commercial or office on the first floor, it's residential on the upper floors, or if they're multi, um, if they're multifamily, um, you're just going to make a better use of a limited amount of landscape. And when you're trying to be walkable to the downtown, you really want to get that third dimension. You don't want to just start building single story. You really want to build that multi-story structures, build that density in, build that 
um, walkable downtown. And it's just a key design feature that you find if you look at good walkable communities, one of the first things you're going to find is they are multi-story structures. Um, and because Riverfront was meant to be pedestrian oriented, it, it follows that we wanted to continue that. Um, because most of, if you look at a lot of Berry Street um, and even Stonecutter's Way, they're all multi-story. And the idea was just to continue that. Um, and that, of course, then when we get up here, this, this also, these two properties were also zoned for that, even though they actually are not currently in that design. They're all single story structures. Thanks. Uh, well, John, you're new to this discussion. I mean, do you, uh, I'm not trying to put you in the spot or anything, but, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts, uh, right now? Um, I mean, it seems like it just makes sense to put these properties into Eastern Gateway. seems like they are a better fit for that district. I've been looking, you know, specifically at the existing uses on that side of the road. I don't ever, I don't ever see that, that side of the road becoming, you know, us building like a, uh, urban facade where it's a, you know, a place where people are going to be walking, right? If you're walking, you're coming from the other side of the street and you're walking there or you're, you're coming from, uh, pioneer and you're, it just for that specific area, you know, not, not that there's a, a huge difference between the two districts, but um, if the options are put one, add one as a conditional use in this, this other district, um, or, you know, move this one parcel that already is seems to be mostly already made up of this use. Why don't we just flip it over there? So are you, that's my are you, initial take. Yeah. So, so the, you know, each of these, each of these, uh, approaches had pros and cons that we discussed last time. I mean, the, the, the big con with changing anything to Eastern gateway is that there's a lot of stuff that could, that could be put in, in the long term. Is that something that you, um, like what degree of concern would you have with, with, with that, that, uh, you know, we could end up getting an industrial use or a car dealership or something. Well, and looking at the, um, all of those, I think they're mostly all conditional uses anyway. So, you know, I would trust in our review process and I, I'm not overly concerned for that. Um, specific parcel. It's next to a car wash. Yeah. What's up, Barb? No, I was just wondering if, John, if you um, understood the other uh, discussion about splitting this particular parcel because it's it's split already by the railroad right away. It's really hard to tell that from the map, but um, the uh, car wash and um, the other uses that are adjacent to Route 2 um, are one side of that railroad right away. The uh, self-storage units that are right along the river, which is prime location for perhaps for future development as residential, those are on the other side of the railroad track. So that was why we talked about splitting it potentially into Eastern Gateway and leaving the uh, other portion as Riverfront. So Mr. Barrett owns both both sides of the railroad tracks. He owns the entire, other than the laser wash, he owns all of the, the property from Pioneer Street um, out to um, the old Grossman's lot and route to that whole area. So um, it includes a number of businesses. Some of them are self store. There's the um, medical marijuana dispensary building. There's the 
um, insurance agent and there's um, the bare naked growler. Um, so all of those are on that same parcel. Um, and so the initial proposal was to shift all of those to Eastern Gateway, um, but the Planning Commission felt that just the areas south of the railroad right of way that go, so basically from the railroad right of way to Route 2 to Pioneer Street would be included. Um, and the other part would remain in Riverfront. Does that make sense to you? Oh, you're uh, muted. Oh, I, um, I was going to say, I, I understand it. It was a little unclear to me looking at, I've got like three maps up on the screen here that I'm trying to make sense of. Um, but that's, that was helpful to understand that. So like that sliver, okay. sliver north of the railway would be proposed to be, to stay as Riverside. Yes. If you want a response from Mr. Barrett. Yes, please. That'd be okay. great. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What's, what's the question? Well, well, what they're asking is, um, so in terms of splitting the parcel with the railroad tracks in the middle and making Eastern Gateway just the area that's south of the railroad tracks, so your parcel would be split so that Eastern Gateway would be extended only for the area that's along the road between the road and the and railroad tracks. Yes. Right, right. So um, your position is that would also that would work. Um, and the total uh, parcel, there are nine out of twelve buildings that have been made non-complying. That's how many of the storage buildings there are on the lot. And the car wash, of course, has been made in non-compliance. Um, so either the entire par parcel and the car wash, um, we were requesting that it be extended in, uh, so that Eastern Gateway would cover the whole property and the car wash, or just that strip um, along the road between the road and the rail bed would also work for both properties as well. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, well, for, for time purposes, I mean, I think, you know, everyone but John has had a time has, you know, had opportunity to, to discuss this prior to this. So just, um, can I get a, can I get a straw poll? I mean, John spoke in favor of splitting the parcel. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the language, but splitting the parcel using the railway. Uh, so can I, can I get some indication of who might be willing to uh, vote for an amendment along those lines. I, I think we could put the whole, probably put the whole thing in, but. Um, Aaron, John, you said put the whole thing into Eastern Gateway? Yeah, I, I don't think, and I've been going through the list of uses here. I wouldn't have, uh, I think, an objection to that. I, th I think our concern that was voiced, sorry, Kirby, can I, can I? Yeah, please. Thanks. The concern from last week or a couple weeks ago was that in zoning, in the zoning changes, I have to assume that they made that intentionally, the change intentionally. It's also my assumption that uh, the existing uses can't, aren't hindered by being out of compliance with the zoning now. Like they can continue to do the things they're doing and make up, you know, make changes or upgrades or maintenance or whatever that, please correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I, I think they're fine to continue as is, but looking forward, this place is more connected to the downtown of Montpelier than the rest of Eastern Gateway. There is a natural break there where the forest comes down. It's It feels very separate. There's been infrastructure development to create more walkability out that direction. And so bringing Eastern Gateway in further, I think sort of goes against what I assume the intent of changing that zoning was 
at the time, which was to like, if Montpelier wants, you know, housing and, and more, more affordable housing and stuff closer into downtown, that's our zone to do that in. And, you know, if we just keep letting Eastern Gateway come in, the it's potentially more likely that it will remain more industrial uses and not housing. But that's the zone. I mean, like, Sabin's Pasture is directly across the street, so if that's ever going to be housing, like, we're not talking far away here. We're, we're in, it would be kind of neighborhood-ish, or it could be. So I think that was the concern. That's still where I'm at. Like, I'm having a hard time feeling like, I'm having, I'm having a hard time wanting to put it all in the Eastern Gateway and not worrying about it because it does to me feel like um, there was some intent or I assume, I have to assume there was some intent to give us a better chance of creating walkability, creating housing in that area. Yeah, and if I could just dovetail with what Marcella just said, my, my thinking is, fairly in line with that. And in fact, I'd go even a little further, you know, I just look at this as there was a deliberative process that went on to, to make these zoning changes. Those changes were contemplated, you know, and, and approved by the uh, city council. Um, you know, I think that there are gonna be some changes in terms of the, the outlay of the city. Uh, you know, you're already starting to see it with the introduction of the distillery and sort of things moving out to the east. Um, and I would even go so far as to just say, I don't think that splitting the parcel makes any sense. Um, I don't know of another uh, zoning area where we where we split specific parcels to make these sorts of determinations. And more to the point is if, and I mean, this is a broad, this is a huge assumption, and I will admit that, but if the railroad abandons that line that goes through there, which I think, you know, is not an unreasonable assumption at this point, uh, I think that, that, that fundamentally changes what the potential uses of that land is going forward. And uh, splitting the parcel, I think, still opens the door for uses between the railroad right away and Route 2 that I think the city council contemplated and decided that they didn't want. Um, so uh, I, I think the way to thread the needle is to make it a conditional use. There are some guardrails that are put in place in terms of what can happen uh, at the site, but if Mr. Barrett wants to put in uh, storage units there, he's able to do that through the uh, conditional use uh, sort of process. So Aaron, can I, I'm, I just need to be clear, are you saying the conditional use and leave it um, in Riverfront, the entire parcel, right? Yeah, that's, that's my suggestion. Okay, yeah. all right. I, I just wanted to make sure I understood. Sure. May I just respond with a couple points <clears throat> um, to the two um, folks that just spoke? Go ahead. I understand um, the future, the desire to alter development in the future. But this is a property that, I mean, we have to also talk about reality. Now, when you sit, when Yes, this went through a deliberative process, but you know what? It, it uh, has worked uh, to the disadvantage of my clients. It also was problematic over in the Bailey Avenue section. And you can always say, yeah, we're not going to tweak our zoning because we went through a deliberative process. But then when you're confronted with unintended consequences, perhaps, um, and certainly we have 13 buildings on this piece of land, 10 of them because of what just happened in zoning made the 10 of them non-compliant. And the multi-millions of dollars that have been invested in developing this property since 1970, 50 years ago, when 50 and when 80,000 gallon tanks uh, were removed from the property, all at the expense of the Barrett family. If they're a business that's been in business for over 100 years in Montpelier. And so 
the point that we want to make is other than just making buildings non-compliant that will remain there for many, many decades into the future is kind of an absurdity to suggest just because you've changed the zoning, the only thing you're going to prevent is the Barrett's finishing and placing their last uh, building uh, on the property that was developed in phases. If it were Act 250, we probably could sail through on a plan implemented in stages. Um, so all we're trying to do is, I mean, these have been beautifully um, kept, very great businesses, people around um, who are uh, contractors, uh, accounting offices, lawyers, they come daily to pick up files from these um, warehouse, mini warehouse units. And I would also mention that um, what Barbara pointed out about the fact that in Riverfront you have a conditional use for warehouse or storage that doesn't have a requirement that it be attached to some other business um, is rather curious. On a deliberative process, why in the world would you put a more intense big warehouse as a conditional use in Riverfront if you're trying to create pedestrian friendly properties and all of that, yet you're not going to allow the mini storage units that have been there for many years. Um, so we don't have any problems splitting the property if that's preferable. Whatever happens with the railroad happens with the railroad and you have, I have seen many situations over my 25 years doing zoning cases where a property fell in more than one district. In fact, zoning ordinances talk about, um, and Title 24 talks about what to do in those instances. So um, we just, it would be too bad if on the notion that we want to change things and don't want to extend this, it's really just a name in many respects. The property is already developed. This isn't going to change anything in the next 50 years. And we would just um, like for these businesses to continue to be able to operate. Uh, there's one last expansion that the Barretts were trying to um, deal with. And had they known that the zoning process was going on, they would have participated to say, hey, what do you mean you're making my, my property Riverside, Riverfront, and I will be in non-compliance. So uh, we're just looking for some help in the most minimal way in terms of impacts on anyone else, but we think we should be treated like the Bailey Avenue um, area. We don't understand why this is being seen as a deliberative process, and yet unintended consequences or mistakes or changes can be made elsewhere because that's illogical and inconsistent. So we're just hoping that this can be resolved one way or the other. And we would like laser wash to also be treated fairly. I don't know what you do with mini storage buildings to make them look like they have two stories unless you kind of build a, an old west facade or something to try to accommodate that requirement. And, and there is a building, at least one building on the property that is more than one story, and that's the largest building, which is the trading post. That is a two-story building. All right. Um, Point of um, clarification, if I could ask, we're only talking about the part east of the bridge, right? Yeah. Hi, do, you, do, you have the, do you have the map that Mike sent out for this meeting? Um, it was it was with the agenda. Yeah, I, I've got that map and several others, and that's what I my understanding of it is. But it also only has parcel lines on it. So, uh, well, so oh. there's so there's this there's this uh, the lattice design on there that, sh that that shows exactly what we're talking like what's under consideration. You want me to use the to share my screen and. But yeah, no, I've got it. I understand it. I just wanted to make yeah. sure I understood, like, that was clear. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, so for, for purposes of moving things forward, um, um, so it sounds like uh, I'm, I'm not hearing that we have a majority. Um, well, the, where was so the, with the far parcel approach? Because well, where was Mar where was Marcella? Because I thought Barb's Barb was for split, 
in Eastern Gateway. You were for split in Eastern Gateway. John, I thought, was thinking all of them, but split in Eastern Gateway would be okay. And if Marcel is okay. Yeah, I guess I, I mean, I don't love it, but I could do split in Eastern Gateway at least allows for some potential of housing in that area. I, I mean, From yeah. Mar yeah, Marcel, to be clear, I, um, what do you think of the other approach, which which is to al to allow storage units in the neighborhood, but but nothing, but but to not ex extend in Eastern Gateway? Yeah, I mean, I kind of find that six of one, half a dozen of another it would be a conditional use. So housing is like an option in Eastern Gateway, but like I feel like that's less likely, and conditional use. So that means that it's an option. It's an option to have storage units in the city, which is probably less likely, but not a great option because I mean, mini storage is a vehicle for the most part a vehicle uh, enterprise based enterprise. So I feel like it's, I don't know, just kind of six of one, I guess. Yeah. They seem sort of the same to me. I, I mean, I, I, I prefer to, to try to solve this without expanding the Eastern Gateway. I mean, I, my, my, mo my biggest concern is to extend industrial allowed, you know, even though they're permitted uses and there's a review process. I mean, um, right now, I don't know. I, so so I, I don't like extending Eastern Gateway. I'd, I'd like to do something more surgical, but, uh, you know, I'll go either way, though. Um, I'll go anything short of extend, extending Eastern Gateway to the entire parcel. I, I know I guess it, that's kind of how I feel, too. Like, I, 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 I understood John's point that, I mean, or, or at least I, um, after listening to John, I, my reflection is that, Yes, maybe keeping a sliver on the river side of riverfront is, you know, symbolic and does in the, at the end of the day doesn't really matter. Um, but it does make me feel a little bit better about n not extending the Eastern Gateway for, for the entire parcel. But uh, Kirby, yeah, may I make a motion? Um, <laughs> yeah, if you if you think you have something that everyone would be supportive of. I move the, the planning commission approve a change to the parcel that would split the parcel, have uh, the land between the railroad track to Route 2, have Eastern Gateway be extended to that area, and have the, the uh, land north of the railroad right away uh, remain in Riverside. Okay. Uh, I seconded, but I was I, I was on mute. Okay, so we have a second from John. Uh, can can we say it again, real just slowly? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I move that we change the zoning in the parcel along these lines. The area from the railroad right away to route two in other words the southern part of the parcel eastern gateway will extend to that area that would include mm -hmm. the car wash and that would include everything south of the railroad right away okay. everything north of the railroad right away to the riverfront would remain as currently zoned okay thank you and uh yeah Okay, so we have that. And we have a second from John. Uh, there's so so getting into the into the notes and bolts of the procedure of it. And I'm sorry that my um, uh, skill here is is a little lacking. But there is a discussion before we go to vote, right, Mike? You're muted, Mike. Yes. If you need another discussion, you can take it. Or so, you can move to vote. It's up to you. But before we move to vote, I just want to make sure because you know we have vying resolutions here. Um, but we only have one motion on the floor. We only have one motion on the floor, so 
Uh, I just, I just, okay. I want to know uh, this is the last chance for anyone to say that they strongly prefer some other approach before we vote. Is there anybody who want to say that? Okay. Does anybody, does anybody want to discuss anything before we vote? Okay. So those in favor of the Aaron's motion say aye. 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 So any opposed? Okay. Nay. What? Aaron voted nay. I'm voting nay. <laughs> oh, okay. So you were, okay, that was misleading. You were putting that forward just for the sake of moving things along. Correct. All right, fine. All right. So, so it's four to one. It did pass then. Uh, and, and that's our resolution of this. So thank you, Aaron, for that. So I think technically what we would just need now is the motion to send this to city council for consideration. Can we send to city council with like an explanation of the discussion or do we just send the one liner? How does that usually work? We can send it with whatever you'd like. Send it with Mike. <laughs> it will go with me. Yeah. Uh, if there's if there's anything you want included in that, um, either either you guys are welcome to have somebody go to the meeting, which as Kirby knows, he went to a number of city council public hearings um, to to kind of represent the views. Or opinions, um, or I will do my best to reflect what your thoughts were. Or you can write it down and send it to me, and I'll be happy to read it into the record for them. Uh, is it going to be the, the next city council meeting that this goes to? It will be on the, it has been scheduled for the 12th of August. That will be an introductory meeting. The public hearing, because there's need needs a time period, you need to have 15 days warning in the newspaper for the time period to be official. Um, I think there's a second meeting in August on the 26th. Yes, I think it's 12th and 26th. So the 26th would be the hearing. And so if it passes, um, I'll warn it for the 26th and it only needs one hearing. So it could be passed that night as presented or it could take multiple nights. As, as you know, we did, what, 22 of them on the zoning in 2017? Um, okay, well, I'll, uh, I, it, I can I can go to and just be on standby on the August 12 meeting and uh, it, anyway, I'm fine with doing that. Or Marcella, if you prefer, I mean, we could, we could write something up and agree on it together and send that as well yeah okay um i'll take i'll take advice on that um i could either either way okay well the simplest thing is i could just i could just go and be will uh, like i imagine it playing out i'll just say that i'm i'm there to describe the process if they'd like to hear it and you know mike would give his explanation first is that, okay. is that good enough um, yeah, yeah, if you're willing, yeah. Sure. Yep. Okay, I'll do that. Thanks. Um, yeah, and you can also feel free to come. Okay. And represent. Uh, okay. Well, looks like we we have a, a resolution there. Um, it looks like uh, so. So Brooke and um, Mr. Barrett, uh, do you understand? the vote and uh, the next steps and everything. We do. Thank you very much for all the time that you folks have devoted to this. It's uh, really appreciate um, all of your efforts and all of your thoughts. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I still, still need the motion to forward to city council for consideration. I'll move to forward to city council for consideration. I'll second. Okay. We have a first I'm to stag your motion. Um, okay. All those in favor of uh, forwarding uh, 
to, to city council for, rec for uh, recommendation say aye. aye 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 any opposed okay so we will we'll send that proposal to city council as a four to one vote okay next on the agenda if i can find it is a review of the draft energy plan implementation strategy uh let's get 40 minutes for that do we have those documents mike yeah they were sent last time and they were sent this time as well i can quickly resend them no i i found it here okay okay, okay. and so, so this is the implementation strategy for the energy plan. Would you, will you describe to us uh, like what this document's about? So this one is really much more complex than some of the other ones. So it really groups into three groups of three. So you actually have nine aspirations and this really goes to how much the the city's net zero 2030 and 2050 um how much they kind of really had to break it into pieces um the first three aspirations are really looking at the functions of city government and how do we make us um, net zero for electricity how do we make us net zero for transportation and how do we make us net zero with respect to um, heating and the thermal goals that we have? So we've got kind of those three. So you, and this kind of runs through it. So you've, you've got electricity, transportation, and heating um, as kind of three pods. And then we've got city government. Um, And how did they break that up? B, C. B, e, F. Actually, they, they eventually, re originally it had residential and commercial, and I guess they merged the residential and commercial. So they got it down to six. So you had the three for what the government would do, because our strategies for how we change what we do as a government are different than the strategies we're going to need to get the public to um, be net zero with respect to electricity and home heating and transportation. So it's really broken into those, those six boxes. Um, and they've had a lot of detailed work on what they had for goals. And a lot of this kind of came back to starting to, to basically put pen to paper and start to get them to answer the question of how. So they've had a lot of discussions over the years on what they wanted to see. Um, and in some cases, they had some strategies on how, but this was really starting to push down and really start to say, OK, if we're going to have net zero um, if, if City Hall is going to be net zero, what's that going to take? So we really had a lot more conversation about the specific strategies. And most of the ones for the municipal government were really looking at the capital improvement plan and those types of, of programs. And then we had a much longer discussion about, okay, how is it we're going to get to net zero for the public, for those other three? Um, let's say the private private development for home heating you know how are we going to get people to insulate their homes how are we going to get people to switch from oil furnaces to wood pellets or to um, air source heat pumps um, you know we can't just go and and hope that they're going to do it we really have to start talking about programs and uh, tax incentives and um, do we want to change 
our building codes? Do we want to adopt building codes that will require all new construction to be net zero or to meet a certain um, insulation standard? Because right now um, we, we can't require people to do that. Um, you know, as we pointed out, we know of one person who, you know, just is, is very much against these ideas and in fact installed a, a coal furnace just to kind of thumb, thumb their nose at the system. Yes. And, you know, you start asking the question, well, what do you do in those instances? If we want to be net zero, you know, having people run around installing coal stoves is and brand new ones is not going to be, you know, constructive. We have to find ways that go and say, no, that's actually not. So we may need to have regulations. So a lot of this kind of comes out of a lot of those really hard discussions. Uh, they spent a lot of time trying to come up with benchmarks. I didn't spend a lot of time working with the benchmarks and some of them you'll still notice are in yellow because they really never quite nailed them down. But we had enough to get the strategies and to start framing out these discussions of how are we going to get electric cars? How are we going to get transportation? So that's a lot of what we were trying to focus on. Mike, did you point out that the two different time uh, deadlines, the 2030 and the 2050? Yes. Yeah, so this, this, the municipal aspirations are all tied to 2030. So the goal is to have city government reach net zero by 2030, while the private sector would reach net zero by 2050. Um, so there are two different timelines. And so a lot of the higher priority items are in the earlier ones for the city government, because if we're going to reach 2030, we've got to start acting now. And when we're looking at the private stuff, there's some of them they think are important. We need to start now because we've got so far to go. We really need to start now. And these benchmarks would be moved to the appendix. Is that correct? I'm not sure how it's going to, the benchmarks will end up playing out in the end. Um, I, we, we still have got to figure out how this gets formatted. I mean, these are just in here, as we had mentioned before, these, how this looks in this document is not how it's going to look when it's in the plan. This is really just a way of being able to frame things out. So when people look at something and say, Goal B, you know, we want to replace all residential and commercial heating fuels with renewable heating sources by 2050. Now let's really start to drill down to, all right, what would it take to be able to do that? How would we get 100% of all of our residential and commercial heating fuels to be renewable by 2050? To a certain extent, we're going to have to have regulations that say all new units that get installed meet a certain requirement. How do we do that? How do we have that rule in effect? Um, and then how do we incentivize people to do fuel switching, you know, and, and down the line? So, um, but how that, how this actually gets presented when we're done with the plan, it's going to probably look a little bit functionally different because this is, this is clunky because like we had mentioned before, you're going to have, you know, develop a net zero 2050 implementation plan and that gets repeated over and over and over again and we really don't want to be doing it that way so we'll come up with a better way to do it. so you got an assistant john <laughs> cute so barbara are you on the energy committee um, yes, I was when this was being developed. This is this is really good. This is a really good outline. Well, it's it's got a lot in it, um, and so that's the only my only concern is that it kind of it's kind of overwhelming. Um, but I, I'm glad to hear, as Mike said, that the formatting may end up being a little bit different. So. And, and okay. a little bit, oh, go ahead, Aaron. So can I ask a kind of a big picture question, Barb, since you're sure. familiar with this? 
Was the Energy Committee concerned about uh, sort of outline, outlining sort of uh, goals and surrounding uh, the siting of renewables in the city? Um, I'm thinking specifically about like the Act 174 issues. Yeah, we were we were involved in the once the the um, Central Vermont Regional Planning uh, effort around energy. Um, the uh, the thing with the, with that is that they had not identified any re renewable energy generation in the within the city limits of Montpelier. Um, it was really in surrounding areas. So, um, so essentially, it didn't it didn't impact us in terms of what where we might cite something. Is that what you were asking, Aaron? Yeah, no, it is. I, I was just curious because I kind of assumed, I, I thought maybe that was the answer, which is there's not really a lot of good areas to cite renewables. Right. Um, they didn't they didn't give us a wind generator or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's thanks. That's helpful. Anyone else have any comments about the plan? I think it's really well structured and I think it, it provides a really good roadmap for how to really memorialize a lot of this stuff. Um, I, I think it's pretty good. I don't have any specific questions just reading it. This is the second time I've read it, but the first time I didn't have anything. So they did have, there were, there were a couple of places where they didn't have the answers to the question. So, you, you know, as I mentioned, we were, we were talking about how to, um, how to reach those goals of net zero. And so a number of places you see, they'll just develop a 2030 or 2050 implementation plan. And that's really just to go through and say, we don't have all the answers yet. We have some ideas that are going to get us there. Or if we do the strategies we've outlined, we're going to get 50, 60, 70% of the way there. But for the most part, we're not getting 100% to where we want to get to. And that's why there is a catch-all for a lot of these to develop an implementation plan. And the MEAC really wants to, to hire somebody to come in in the same way that Burlington spent, you know, $100,000 plus to do their energy plan their energy implementation strategy it was a, a much more um, a much deeper dive than I was able to give this strategy, but we were able to start to talk about, you know, the, the framework of pieces, knowing that all the pieces aren't here, but hopefully we'll get more pieces as these implementation plans are developed. And I think it introduces a few of the aspects that we need to be looking at just to give the public a general idea of how complicated the issue becomes. So, but I think you're um, adding in the 2030 or 2050 implementation plan is a critical element to it because we can't identify all of the strategies here. Yeah, it seems like a lot of good work went into this. Um, I think obviously some things could be simplified or removed, and that's not to say that, you know, they're bad ideas or they won't happen or just because they're not in here, you know, they can't be uh, looked at more by the, the Energy Committee just because it is a little bit, it can be a little bit overwhelming. But I think maybe reframing it or presenting it in a different way might it may not look as um, as overwhelming. I do feel like there was a, there seems to be a discounting of the um, of the costs associated with um, adding either regulation or ordinances. We've got like three different ones potentially proposed here, all marked as costing low. I think having the city adopt its own um standards for some of these things might i would approach it with caution you know having our own labeling standards stretch code requiring net zero 
uh, are all marked as as um, having a low cost um, and you know and, and other things like having a, a what was it like the you know level three vehicle charging is marked as having like a higher higher cost um, you know one of those things is is relatively easy and you put it in and it's done and and the other one requires um a lot of human capital that i don't think we're, we're recognizing here uh, but aside from that i think the general strategy obviously you know encouraging promoting housing walkable community in and around our downtown um seems seems obvious and and it's good that we're recognizing it here uh, there may be a i guess, try to think of a better a way to capture um capture like the not to quantify it but having more people and businesses in montpelier means um fewer vehicle miles traveled and um you know there are huge energy gains there as well yeah we actually did discuss that but it and that ends up being coming a land use or economic development piece that was not necessarily related to energy so um it sort of become those kinds of aspects are very important to to um shorten those vehicle miles traveled but ultimately it wasn't anything the energy committee could require um actually aspiration f is the one that talks about vehicle fuel fossil fuel use um and you'll see that there are still some some holes in that part for example goal b under aspiration f is the transit ridership still we don't necessarily have a goal on that was any number ever talked about on that mike page seven no it was um those those kind of came out different and we never really did nail those down because yeah we were also not sure how it might tie into the transportation chapter so you know if they were going to touch on on it or not um so those two this section of the energy plan and the transportation plan needs to be um coordinated yeah and i think the transportation plan has done a good job of uh, certainly in their aspiration um to to address a number of the things that john and and you are looking at because they're one of their aspirations is to that um that you can live i'm trying to remember exactly how it was worded you can live in montpelier without the need of a vehicle without the need of a car um and that was it's not to say that we're trying to take everybody's cars away but that we want to have a transportation system such that it's not a requirement you shouldn't be required if you want to live in montpelier you have to be able to afford a car and you have to own a car if you want to live in montpelier and that's true in a lot of communities in the united states is that you have to own a car um, it would be really difficult for you to live in the town of berlin if you didn't have a car um, there are no sidewalks it'd be a long bike rides to things and certainly would be a, not a very convenient way in january to get around um, but we really wanted to go and make sure that you could live in Montpelier. It's not a necessity, not a requirement. And that's what the transportation plan was looking at. Um, and it doesn't mean everywhere in Montpelier, you're going to be walkable or bikeable or able to get on public transit, but that there is ample amounts of um, places where the housing and the transportation overlap that you could um, have a lot of housing choice um where a car is not a necessity um and hopefully that will then translate into options down the road where 
um, you know, whether it's car share, whether it's the micro transit, whether it's transit that, um, you know, whether you're 21 years old and trying to figure out what you're doing, you don't, you know, you can live in town and, and get a job and get, find a place to go grocery shopping and do what you need to do and rent a car if you need it. And that's really what we were kind of looking for. Uh, that's what the transportation committee and that's how they framed it. And hopefully I'll get a meeting with them at some point because they are at like 99% done with theirs. I just have to have one more meeting with them to, to finish theirs. And so they, did they incorporate micro transit, Mike, in the plan? Uh, I believe it's in their plan. Okay. It's mentioned in it. It's been a little while since I've picked it up and read it, but I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, Mike, um, are, you, are you looking for us to approve? Uh, the I mean, they're all approved to a point. I mean, we're just going through, um, you know, approving it. You're not disapproving it. You're not throwing it back to me and saying this, this is not going in a direction that this planning commission is going to support. Um, in which case I would go back. But if, if everyone's still good, then it goes in the pile of things that we start moving towards getting public input on when we're ready for that. And, you know, we, we want to talk a little bit more about how we want to move this planning process forward. We can certainly open, go back to that initial conversation we were having about you know, what do we want to do in these two two windows of time? We've got the, the, the window of time, assuming people said, yes, let's use our municipal planning grant to, to hire somebody to help us with the city plan to help carry this to the finish line. And if that's one thumbs up, then the question is, okay, what would we like them to do? They wouldn't come on till January. And then what would we do before then? And what would we do as a planning commission after that? So, okay, I, I wanna, yeah, I'd like to dovetail on that because I'm, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. My understanding is based on our previous discussions is that we would use that to put, um, to do a lot of the digital work, the, you know, the website type work to, to put the plan in a form uh, that's really like next level. I think we did a lot of talk early on about that. Um, I, my thoughts are between now and then before, before we have a consultant get involved that we figure out a lot of the substantive aspects of it and spend our time doing that. Is, is that where everyone is? They're thinking about the, the planning grant and the what and the how we'll spend our short term. Yeah, I, I mean, I would certainly agree with that, Kirby, um, that um, it'd be tempting to, to get the consultant to do all of this public outreach, but I think ultimately we need to do some of it before the consultant gets involved. And, um, and so it's going to unfortunately fall to us. Yeah, do we, do we have any other thoughts about how to involve the consultant and what we should focus on before a consultant before January. I'm sorry. My, my connection got really bad for a while. I <laughs> what's the, what's going on. I'm so, sorry. so yeah, we're talking, we're talking about, um, you know, this municipal planning grant that we have and a, and a, an opportunity to have a consultant starting in January. And I was talking about, you know, in our past discussions from many months ago, we had talked about using that consultant to uh, develop a website and make our plan, you know, part of a website that's um, more advanced than, you know, what we've, what we've done in the past. Um, and so I, I was just saying I, my, my expectation was we were going to go, go ahead and do that and use, use the planning grant in that way, which, which leaves between now and January for us as the planning commission to sort out a lot of the substantive parts of the plan and to spend our time doing that. And Barb mentioned that it, 
you know, that means that we need to be doing the outreach ourselves too in the meantime, uh, which I agree with. So we're asking if you, do you have any thoughts about, about what's about the short term and, and do your thoughts differ on how to use that municipal planning grant? No, that seems like a good use of the grant money. Um, I guess the only thing I would say is, is that we've got a lot of work to do before January and then that's not a ton of time. Um, so. Yeah, well, now that we're back on track, we can start focusing on this. Uh, so that's at least that's something. That kind of makes sense with what we were talking about earlier, having working groups and maybe being able to move forward more quickly in that way. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the chapters, we were talking about economic development and housing, maybe two chapters that we use for sub use for subcommittees to take a deeper dive. What's everyone's thoughts about some other areas that deserve it? I personally think that energy is in good shape. It's a big area, but I think that um, it seems to be in great shape. So some of these others seem to be either in great shape or they're smaller areas that maybe don't need the same treatment. But but what, what are some areas that we do think need treatment, deeper treatment? So can I ask kind of a silly question? Because I guess this has never been really clear in my mind. What do you envision the scope of the subcommittee's work to be? Um, yeah, well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's something that's still, you know, to be worked out, but, but um, in a loosely, uh, they'll sit down, go through with what, go through what we have so far and do extra homework and in looking into how could we do this better? What needs improvement? Um, if they need to, they could reach out to other sources and kind of do the extra, the, the deeper, you know, dive that we sometimes wish we could do, but we just haven't, aren't able to do in our regular meetings. Um, and it would be up, you know, it, we could do it open-ended kind of like that and leave it at that, or we can decide that, no, we want each of the subcommittees to be very much on um, the same page and we could actually hammer out some, a scope. We could get, we could do that. We could hammer that hammer that out more. I think a, a little bit more structure would be a good thing in terms of here is what you know we would like a subcommittee to to produce, and so that we end up with compatible yeah. uh, products. Um, you know, setting things up so that things are triaged and organized in a certain way. It's like, here's what we identified that, you know, is a slam dunk priority, good stuff, you know, here's some other stuff and here's what we think we can drop and generally, you know, put it in the right buckets, you know, not, doesn't need to be perfect, but if we somehow create some kind of framework to start, start doing that so that things look look similar across across chapters and then we could start bring bringing things together otherwise i'd be worried that we end up with some very different looking um documents that are are you know just here and here i mean one basic question along those lines is i mean do the, do we want the subcommittees to do work like you're talking about and that like producing something or is it more do we want them just to point out general observations about what what we already have and bring that back to the group? But even doing that, I think, needs to be done in a specific way, right? Like how, like what kind of observations or? Yeah. Or what's the basis of the observations that we're we're making? Yeah. Would it would it help Kirby if we? between now and the next meeting try try to formulate some idea of of what we each think that the subcommittee ought to be looking at in a particular section i mean or is each section going to be different i uh, i mean each substantively obviously each one's going to be different no right but in terms of what we yeah how we look yeah. at it so, yeah i mean I, I think 
developing some parameters that are general enough so that they apply to each one, I think is a good idea. Like what John's saying. I mean, yeah, one way I put, I would like, one, one way I think of it is, yeah, I mean, what's the scope? I mean, what are we looking to improve? Based on what I've heard so far from the group, I'm thinking what, what we want is uh, one component of it or one parameter, one factor, however you want to put it, would be to make sh to to look into uh, whether whether the what we have so far in the plan matches community priorities and goals. I think that might be one aspect because that's that's what we you know been concerned with. Maybe another one could be um, does it provide too little or too much information? Because I've heard that I've heard from other from from the group here. I've heard both of those things at different times. So how can this how can this chapter uh, or, or what level of information is appropriate to be provided in this chapter? Maybe that's another parameter. Yeah, but we could keep going with this. And I think that, yeah, we can put it on the agenda for next week and that could be one item and hope, and hopefully we can hammer that out at the meeting next week. How do people feel about that? And when I say week, I mean the next time we meet. Sure, that Perfect. sounds like a good way. Yeah. Can I ask another baseline question really quickly, which is, is there an expectation that the subcommittees will actually draft some of the final uh, chapters, or is this just sort of a working group to kind of hammer out what's going to be drafted? I was thinking more of the second thing, but if, if we, if we think getting into drafting is more appropriate or, or more worthwhile. You know, I'm open to a lot of the iterative process I had with the other subcommittees really was, you know, I, I draft something just to start them thinking. And then there's a lot of chewing on it. Um, you know, the energy plan you see, is not something I, I just wrote and they looked at it. It's, you know, I start throwing things out. They, they take things, they change them, they move them. Um, so it's a very pretty iterative process. Um, so usually there's not a lot of given a blank slate of blank sheet of paper and, and just trying to go and put things together. I sort of thought what these subcommittees would be doing is reacting to what was already drafted. Is that not the case? Uh, yeah, I think that would be the jumping off point. Yeah. Okay. So, so the, they're they're drafting it. Yeah, or we're one, working from something. Yeah, I'll just say the one exception that you can consider as well with your subcommittee idea is um, the planning commission is going to be the committee who's responsible for drafting the land use plan. All right. So it may be that you have one subcommittee that is going to at least tackle the land use plan and you'll be the one who's doing more of the drafting of those to bring back to the whole planning commission to go through and say, you know, I worked with Mike and this is what we've come up with our aspiration for the land use plan. This is what we think are going to be our strategies for accomplishing that. Um, these are our goals. And, and that's going to be, that's going to be a process that takes, that takes some time. I mean, Barb, you went through with the, energy chapter when when we did this as a subcommittee i think we met as a subcommittee four or five times and then we went to the full board at MEAC and met with them twice and then came back once to the subcommittee again to to make some final changes so land use can be complicated and that can be one that there can also be opportunities to get public input as you're going through it You saw that happening at the end of all of the other chapters, though. Is that what you said before, Mike, or, or should we, could we be jumping on that now? You could be jumping on land use, land use now. I mean, I think you guys are familiar enough with all of these pieces to kind of start to, to see how they come together. And that's going to be, you know, you don't have the transportation chapter yet, but you will be getting it. You don't have the natural resources chapter, but you'll be getting it. And I can fill you in on what, the, what, where they're going, where they're leaning on things. And that's going to be the challenges. You know, we, we have, 
what is it, 10 square miles? And you know, what, how, do we, how do we do the land use for our 10 square miles? We're gonna have some places that are more um, protection of the natural resources. We're gonna have floodplains and we're gonna have to kind of start to layer these pieces together. And that's where, you know, whether it's using GIS or whether it's just thinking in concepts, we've got to start coming up with what's our, what's our generalized land use plan look like? We have a zoning map, that's great, but that's not really what we're building here. We're not building a zoning map. We're looking at a generalized land use plan so we can look to the future and say, you know, where do we want development? You know, where do we want things to maintain, evolve, transform? You know, we're gonna probably be talking about our historic district and talking about how, we, how do we ma maintain these areas? Um, what are the areas that, that need to change? We're going to have um, certain areas that are going to be more transformative. We've got the whole Route 302, our Eastern Gateway District is auto-oriented. I mean, I, I don't see that our future goals for this part of town is to remain and continue as auto-oriented. I think that's going to be a transformative area. And, and what's it going to take to do that? How do we change you know, that part of River Street to a walkable, bikeable area. I mean, we got to build sidewalks. And I think that's that's going to go into what are the strategies? Um, what are the priorities? Is that is that our priority for the next eight years to work on that? Or do we have other areas that are, that are going to be the priorities? Those are the conversations we'd have to have. Okay, so uh, you know we can pick this up next week. So it's it's great to have it on everyone's mind. Uh, hammer some of things out. Uh, it's definitely tricky. Uh, I think we're getting close though to to having kind of a group understanding of what we want to do going forward, uh, which is great. So I'll send out uh, sort of beginnings of an outline for the discussion for next week. We'll put it on the agenda. Uh, and then we'll go from there. You know, there's two issues. There's the subcommittees and the outreach issue. So we'll tackle each one. Um, so yeah, everybody brainstorm. This is definitely a lot to work out here. Uh, so with that, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? We do. Okay. I'll second. By Aaron. <laughs> second by Barb. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Okay, you opposed? Okay, we adjourn until uh, second Monday of August. Adios. All right, thank you. Bye.